it's good for me because the light came from you, from audience. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, you know. I'll go over 20 pages for Lithuanian audience and then my colleague for 40 pages for... It's <laughs> 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 gross, it's boring. Prepare a long, long evening. No, okay, it's just to know, uh, just for sound, yeah. How sounds to say in a beautiful, amazing, wonderful language to hear. Uh, oh, uh, I will read the a couple of things from the book. Darkness and in a company, partners. The Mirti Reiki is very much like the Dali Vivenimo, like the Tessin, like the Miega. The ultimate amžiui, that Europa is the Kormaras, Žmonės galiausiai nusprendė nebijoti mirties, nes pavargo nuo pajamės. Jie pradėjo išvesti gyvenimą, mylėtis ir linksmintis, prieš patavo visišką degradaciją, nintelė vertybė buvo, prieš išėjimą patirti po daugiau malonumų. Karas panašus į marą, vokatis saktelėjo dėžuliu, beje žydus ir musulimanus dažnai kartintavo dėl maro sukėlimo. Taip, jeigu manysime, kad jie kalti dėl šio karo, nuo 14 amžiaus nedaug kas pasikeitė, ar jie kalti paklausimus jantis? Dabar tai visai nesvarbu atsakė Vokytis. Kartais atpildas pralenkė kalbį. Vincentas tylėjo, norėjo pagreitėjau nežinti su iš čia, ko toliau nuo teisų samprotavimų, nuo švarai nuskurtos makro, pornos, kur daug kalbančios apie mirtį. Mes neseniai kalbėjome apie nukirstos galvos reikšmę dailio. Taip automatiškai pakartojo Vincentas. Šitai būdavo visada. Esesininkas kalbėdavo, jis tik pritardavo žodėlių taip arba galvos rinktelių. Kol Vokyčio tai nerizino, taip galėjo pergtis ir toliau. Šokiravimas pasakė kainingas labiau savo pačiam nei jam. Galvos nukirstinimas yra viena iš didžiausių galimybių šokiruoti žiūrovų, atkreikti jo dėmesį ir taip tariant sukelti nuostabos pasijų ir vasijų. Kai tai įvyksta, žiūrovas gilinasi į kūrį ir toliau. Šokiruoti, sudominti, atkreikti dėmesį. Fyrilis kaip tik tai ir nori padaryti. Nukirsti galvą žydiškam komunizmui ir atkreikti pasaulio dėmesį, kad šokiruotų, tai dar susimastyti ir pradėti. Įstilėjo. Prisiminė prieš karą į vidus pasakot apie kažkur nukirsta pokalbį. Tada irgi buvo kalbama apie sovietų milžiną, molio kojimis, apie milžiną, kurią nukirsta galva. Kiek tų galvų milžinas turi, kad jas vis kerta ir kerta. Galvos nukirstimo sižiūrėtų ėmėsi daugiausiai tie autoriai, kurie visą savo kūrybą mėgų šokiruoti. Pavyzdžiui, 17 amžiaus tam įtautų apytojus karavačius. Jis labai mėgų šokiruoti, kai jis būtų. Jis ko gero daugiausia nutapęs galvų kapojimų scenų. Tai būtų mano tiesės patvirtimas, jeigu dailininkas, kuris mėgsta šokiruoti dažnai mūsų galvos nukirstimo sužetų, vadinasi, tai yra priemonių šokiruoti. Taip yra priemonė pasakė, kad tik netibėtų. Meninkas negrėpė į dėmės, jis kūrė teorijų, galvų trašė straipsnį ar knygą. Vincentas jam buvo reikalinęs į tam, kad išklausytų, niekad neklausė į romonės. Galbūt tai buvo viena iš šio sumanimo dalių, kokio sumanimo. Viena iš elementariausių ideologijų, kadangi tai vykrinės sužetas, kankinystės ideologija, kankinystės tema. Ta tema vyro ir moteris santyti. Moterį ir ūdinčių pavojingų galių tema. Kai kuriuose pavaikiausiai moteris atrodo susijaukinus jūs. Laiko nukirsta vyro galvo ir atrodo apsvaigus jūs nuo šių regimų. Šiuose sužetuose susitina erotinius ir mirties motyvai. Frodo teorija ta taip pat patvirtina. Erotika ir mirties visai yra ta. Prancūzai netgi naudojo tokį posakį – orgazmas tai mažoji mirtis. Mirties ir erotiko susilėjimą galima visiškai pagalisti įžvelgti šiuose sižetuose. 19 amžiaus 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 Berslis, listuotamas Oskaro Valdo Salomėje, vaizduoja Merginą, ko nebučiuojančių nukirsto jo nuo galvo. Jis pagalvojo apie Judytą, laikančią nukirsto vyrio galvo, jį iškilojant prieš artis kaip nuotrauką, kaip sustabyta mintis, reali, tikresnį gyvenimą. Nuotrauką, kuri laukia jau, kuri atreikia pasiimti. Taigi. Ačiū. 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 Ači
an excerpt from the same novel, a different excerpt from the same novel, uh, Darkness and Company. News about Alexander. Judith would sometimes go out into the city. She would carefully lighten her already quite light-colored hair with hydrogen peroxide and, having become a perfect blonde, she would go for a walk. Vincent didn't like this, but he couldn't stop her. She found acquaintances who, through acquaintances of their own, arranged forged passports and ration cards, the latter an important document that bore witness to a right to live. Later, she took a job at a private translation bureau where she, one of her pre-war friends, worked. And if someone recognizes you, Vincent's limbs went numb just from thinking these thoughts. They would shoot them both, and mother, or at the very least would shove them all in jail. I can't hide in the basement day in, day out, she'd say. Go visit mother, Vincent would say, though he knew it was a poor suggestion. Judith would quietly shake her head. She avoided mother. Sometimes she'd go visit her, but as she said herself, she could only stand her in small doses. Mother liked to drink, and drunk she would seize any interlocutor who happened to be at hand and would not let go until he or she finally sprung loose, unable to stand her endless reminiscences about sunny days and those times when she sang and danced and was the most desirable woman on Las Vegas Freedom Avenue. Judith would bring work home, and each time was a meaningful journey from the underground world to the kingdom of light, as she'd say. But after every one of these excursions, she would return gloomy and distant. They've turned us into slaves, she said. I'm always coming across brigades wearing the star, moving through the back streets of the city. They work anywhere, do anything, just as long as it's hard, back-breaking work. Prisoners of war and the Jews have been made into the cheapest form of labor without paying any mind to humanitarian criteria. The other day I saw several men pulling a wagon pile full of firewood, a wagon that would usually take two strong horses, and they, just a few of them, were pulling that wagon up a small hill. And as if that wasn't enough, the guard was hitting them with the butt of his gun. And today, I, bet my, I met my gynecologist, my professor. He didn't recognize me, the poor man. He was walking on the cobblestones accompanied by a soldier who was walking on a sidewalk. She looked at Vincent with eyes full of hurt, and it wasn't a German, but a Lithuanian partisan. Vincent didn't have anything to add. He had seen this himself on more than one occasion. Their relations deteriorated, or maybe not deteriorated, but simply became increasingly tepid. Even though every time he returned from the latest action Vincent washed, he scrubbed his skin until it hurt. Still, he felt like he stank of bleaching powder. And they made love less and less frequently. It became increasingly difficult for him to force his way through the dead, shot, defiled bodies to reach his lover to reach the body of his one and only. More and more often they would make love after drinking or after snorting some powder. And still, sometimes he would be overcome with the fear that he would again hear the same crackling sound he heard at the start of the war, the sound he heard more than once later on by those large pits piled full of dead bodies. When the Jews were forced into the ghetto, Max Hanke's photo atelier, where Vincent worked, transferred into the hands of the nationalist civil servant Baranowskis. He didn't chase Vincent out, though he did not show him any great love either. There wasn't much work, but Vincent remained at the atelier all the same. Returning home that evening, he had found Judith even more distressed than usual. She sat at the table with her eyes buried in a book. When he came to kiss her, she turned away from his touch, and the smell of alcohol wafted from her. Your mother had me over, she said, as though by way of explanation, and immediately lit a cigarette, her fingers trembling. Did something happen, he asked. Yes, something. 
a very big something. Judith nodded her head. His breast tightened. Suddenly he felt that he could lose her. He didn't know how or why, but it was possible. Everything was possible in this cursed war. For nearly two years before the war, they had met in secret. The meetings were rare, but he wouldn't forget them for a long time. They were such celebrations of feeling and desire. They were worth living for, and they were worth giving your life for, no matter how paradoxical that may sound. Now that he could see her every day, he constantly worried that all of this would suddenly disappear, that it would end, vanish. Is it somehow he began but didn't finish? He didn't know what direction to go in. Maybe she had learned that he worked for the Nazis. The whole time he had justified it to himself, saying that he was working for the homeland, but how long can you fool yourself? There is no homeland. The Nazis don't see the Lithuanians as equals. The city is full of shops dedicated only to the Germans, restaurants and cafes only for Germans. Even the merest good-for-nothing German held himself ten times superior over any Lithuanian. The battalion soldiers don't have uniforms. They walk around dressed in their own clothes. The storehouses are full of Lithuanian army uniforms, but the Germans don't use them. They don't want the Lithuanians to look like real soldiers. Alexander has turned up, she finally said. What? You saw him? Where? Sometimes I go to the school where the Jewess from the ghetto work. I bring them a bit of food. We're short of food ourselves. No, we're really not short. If you heard the stories they told, they live in near starvation. Okay, do what you think is right. Vince's, Vincent's voice sounded unpleasant, almost hostile. He wasn't sorry for the food. He was jealous of Judith. She didn't just bring those Jewesses food, she brought them a piece of herself. She gave a piece of herself to strangers instead of giving it all to him, to Vincent. He understood that this was egotistical and maybe even pitifully childish, but he couldn't do anything about himself. Judith didn't answer, only gave Vincent a piercing look. Sooner or later, it was going to happen. All these visits could not end well. In the enclosed yard next to the school, a starred brigade was cutting firewood and washing soldiers' clothing. I gave them my pack of cigarettes, and they were happy as children. And one of them recognized me. I didn't recognize him. Isaac Lipser. He's shrunk by half, withered. He sometimes used to play with Alexander. He told me that my husband is alive in the ghetto, and he asked why I wasn't with him. I didn't have an answer for him. Why am I not with him? Why? I don't know. Maybe I should be with those who are under the earth, in the pit at the seventh fort. That's not your fault. I should go back. I should go back to Alexander and his wife. We didn't divorce. No, you can't. No way. You have your documents. You can get a divorce and live at my place, with me. Become my wife. Judith shook her head. I have to go back. I feel like a dirty whore. Vincent didn't know what to do, how to stop her. Totem Cope. They arrived at the action a few hours early, which is why they allowed the men to walk around a bit. Vincent also went out into the town. He took several photographs of the church. Afterwards, he crossed the market square and saw the synagogue building. Down the street, past a few more houses. He raised his camera again and pressed the shutter release. He had gotten a camera, a Leica II, from a German. It was fitted with a built-in rangefinder that was connected to the lens, so it was a fine camera. He didn't like to photograph buildings, but in recent days, he wasn't all that interested in photographing people either. Their faces, their bodies. He felt as though he'd started to fear looking people in the eye, so that he wouldn't see their mockery, their disdain, their disgust. Sometimes when he saw passers-by, he suddenly imagined them dead, lying in rows, half-naked, one on top of the other in pits. 
They could all suddenly one day find themselves there. An order from a single lunatic was enough to change everything. Looking at the market square one more time, he decided to photograph it from up high, and, not hurrying, he walked over to the church. The churchyard was empty. Several wilted bouquets of flowers lay by a recently filled grave. A natural death and an individual grave seemed like a strange luxury. He looked around, hoping to see the priest, or at least the sexton. He didn't see anyone, not a living soul. Maybe it was the priest's grave, and the church had been left without a shepherd. In his childhood, when he used to go to church with Joseph, Joseph used to call the priest the captain. Why captain, Vincent would ask. And Joseph would reply that the church was a huge boat, and the priest was the boat's captain. So who's Christ? He once asked Joseph. Christ is life. He's the sea where we silly fish dive in, and it's only the holy apostles' nets that can catch our poor souls and drag them out into the real life. Fish die on the shore, said Vincent. He had made certain of this fact on many occasions while fishing with the rod he had made himself. Joseph laughed and then tussled his hair with his palm, ossified from his tools, and repeated, fish die on the shore. The church door was closed but not locked. Immediately to the left of the entrance was a stairwell leading up into the belfry. He walked several steps toward the door beyond which he saw the central nave. Though the church was small, it had three naves. The central one ended at a large altar, and to the left and the right of the altar, smaller altars loomed in the half-dark. In the pews were several scarf-covered bent heads. There was no priest visible at the altar. It wasn't time for mass, so what would he be doing here? Or maybe he really was dead, buried just now in the churchyard. The women hadn't noticed that the priest had died and, out of habit, continued to pray. The captain dies, but the ship, out of inertia, continues to sail. Maybe it was exactly in the same way that they didn't notice that half of the houses in the town had emptied that half of the townspeople had suddenly disappeared as though they turned into water, into the sea, which is life, but not life for everyone. Vincent returned to the stairs up into the belfry. He climbed up the crooked wooden steps. When he spied the bell rope, something flashed, and he heard the sound of wings flapping, a bird, a crow or a pigeon. A white feather slowly swayed in the air, then it was caught up on a current of air and flung to the side, disappearing into the tops of trees growing around the churchyard. And again he thought about his stepfather Joseph. When he found out that he was not his real father, he stopped speaking to him. He'd pretend that he didn't hear when he was calling. He no longer wanted to sit in his workshop and take in the smells of glue, the resin, and the freshly planed lumber. To him, it seemed like the biggest fraud, to call yourself a father. His mother told him that she'd asked Joseph not to tell him. I wanted to wait until you were older. I wanted to wait for the right time, she justified. Any time is the right time to lie. The truth requires a special moment. The square was empty, strangely empty. Further on, beyond the row after row of houses perched on edges of the streets, shone the stain of the lake. He raised his camera to his eye several times, but he did not press the shutter release. He could not see the image, could not see the photograph. When he takes photographs, he always sees the photograph. Even before pressing the shutter release, he sees the photograph, the one he wants, the one that is waiting for him. He comes only to take it to confirm its existence. The lake's lens flashed and looked up into the sky. It was also waving. Before what image? Vincent looked down at the empty church square and did not see a photograph. Nothing was waiting for him here. He wanted to climb down, but something caught his hearing. He heard racket coming from the direction of the synagogue. Leaning out over the belfry window, he looked in that direction. The synagogue doors opened, and a group of people poured out from inside. They were men, many men, not less than a couple of hundred, no women or children. 
They were shaggy, dressed in wrinkled clothes with matted hair and sunken cheeks from lack of sleep and hunger. To tell the truth, it was too far to see such details, but now he saw the photograph. He knew that he wouldn't succeed in taking it from the belfry, but he saw their faces clearly. Not their real faces, but the ones that would appear in the photograph. The one he would take if he was there, down below, with them. But he didn't want to be down below, with them. He remained in the belfry. He took a few photographs of the general scene, the crowd herded by the armed local police gathered in the square. He heard commands in German. The police were commanded by a non-local chief. The group stopped in the square and waited for something. A light automobile arrived. An SS officer climbed out. Vincent recognized him. The artist. He'd never seen him work. They used to meet at the German's flat. He'd even met him entering the house through the back entrance, not the main doors, as was proper for servants. Just in case, he slunk off to the side so he wouldn't be visible. And he didn't take any more photographs. He didn't want them to think he was a sniper and accidentally shoot him. The German, who had filmed and photographed in action a week ago, had told him that several of his war photographer correspondent colleagues had been shot by snipers. They were seen as rivals, fighting for the opposite side. You hope for photographs, but you get death, said the German, cleaning the buck cleaning the blood from his high boots with his handkerchief. Vincent watched what was going on in the square from the corner of his eye. The officer ordered the corralled men and ordered them to collect all the horse shit. You see, the market had been on that morning. The men idled slowly in the square, collecting the horse manure and putting it into pouches they made with the fronts of their shirts. Some of them simply held handfuls of horse shit, but they still walked back and forth looking at the ground. They didn't want to dirty their clothes. The policemen urged them on, poking them with the butts of their guns, but the manure collectors were already barely staying on their feet. They probably hadn't eaten for several days. The artist invited an officer over and said something to him. The officer bowed, turned to captives, and commanded them loudly. Little by little, the disorganized mass formed into two lines, one next to the other. He raised his camera to his eye again, but after lingering there for a moment, lowered it. It was too far. The artist used to say, it's the poetry of death that I find necessary, not the agony of expiring beasts. The poetry of gushing brains, the poetry of eyeballs jumping out of eye sockets, the poetry of rotting, stinking intestines, that's the real poetry of death. Fire, the officer commanded. The Jews stood unmoving. Again the command, fire. No reaction. The officer said something to the policemen, and they again began to hit the standing men in their backs. Eventually they started to throw a horseshit. Again, a severe command, lie down, crawl, stand. Then again, lie down, crawl, stand. When the Jews' clothing was completely filthy, they came, there came another command, fall in. And then, in columns of four, they moved towards the lake. He looked in the direction of the lake, and there, before his eyes, naked, exhausted bodies rose out of the lake. Many naked men with stubbly, sunken cheeks, they stood in the water, plunged under and then emerged their long, unkempt hair and tangled beards streaming water, their genitals drooping, shriveling, everything bearing witness to apathy, to hopelessness. If not for the artist, maybe he would have gone down and taken that photograph, the one that was waiting for him down there by the lake. But all that remained for him to do was sit in the tower. The Jews were not allowed to remove their clothes, they were herded into the water up to their waists and ordered to wash. But still he saw them naked to the waist in the water, their lean, dirty hands held up to the sky. A large, shaggy-haired old man with a beard, dressed in a camel wool cloak, held a water hose with both hands and shouts, You brood of vipers, 
who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Which image was real and which only existed in his head? In the photograph or in reality? Which? Afterwards they returned in columns of four. As the captives moved away from the lake and climbed up the hill, a woman approached them. She gave something to the men walking closest to her. The police guard saw this and ran up to the Jew and ripped whatever it was she had handed to him out of his hands. The policeman went over to the officer and gave him the booty, a loaf of bread. Once again, the crowd dispersed into the market square. The officer said something, and the policeman took the loaf of bread, broke it into small pieces, and threw it at the crowd. The men fell onto the mouthfuls of bread, fought for them, and what food they seized, they stuffed into their mouths, and those who were unlucky pulled the luckier ones by the hair, hit them in the face. The bread finished, and a harsh command sounded, fall in. The men moved across the market square towards the synagogue, clothes dripping and feet squelching in waterlogged shoes. They were herded into the building, all except one old bearded man who the guards stopped and asked something, then led him back to the SS officer's automobile. The doors to the temple were closed. Two policemen locked them and remained to stand watch. The artist also asked the bearded old man something, nodded his head, laughed, slapped him on the shoulder, climbed into the automobile, and drove away. The guards led the man away and disappeared behind the synagogue. A few passers-by appeared in the square. They walked with quick steps, keeping as close to the houses as they could, looking around distrustfully. Vincent left the church and returned to the house where the detachment of men was housed. Sometimes they were housed in barracks, but if the town happened to be a small one, they would end up staying with a townsperson who had a large home or with a farmer. The house they were staying in was on the edge of town. He didn't know why, but he also crossed the market square as quickly as he could. Vincent was not at all surprised to see the artist's automobile parked outside his house. The officer waved at him gesturing for him to approach the automobile. Leave us alone, he ordered the driver, who obediently climbed out of the black opal. The officer beckoned him with his head, inviting him inside. I have an assignment for you. He thought the SS officer must have seen him in the church tower and was going to get him for it in some way. The officer nodded at Vincent's camera. Did you take some pictures? A few photos of the church. Okay, now on to my matter. Yes. At the town limits, if you travel along the road to the west, there is a big building. Apparently it's a dairy. I'll find it, Vincent nodded. Wait there after the action. Someone will give you a package. You have to bring it to me. Today, in the evening. Okay. And one more thing, the German said quietly as though wanting to share an intimate secret. A photographer pointing his lens at armed men could be viewed as an enemy sniper. Jacob the Elder speaks in similes. Thank you.